Early 60s television was the era of the action-adventure show, whether it was a western, a spy thriller, or a cop show, the viewing audience loved all of it. For four years, a large portion of the country had been following the travails of Dr. Richard Kimball, a man falsely convicted of murdering his wife. Relentlessly pursued by his nemesis, Lieutenant Gerard, he relentlessly pursued the one-armed man he saw running away from his house the night his wife was killed. It had been announced that this would be the final season, and in the end, all would be resolved. It had to be kind of bittersweet for ABC, because for the past few years, the fugitive had owned that time slot. The turn into 1967 saw another show pop up, this time on CBS. It was called Coronet Blue, and it was rather similar to The Fugitive. In the pilot, we see a man with some other people on a boat. The people tell the man, we know what you did. They beat him up, shoot him, and throw him overboard. Miraculously, he survives and manages to pull himself out of the water. But he doesn't know who he is, where he is, why he's there, or what just happened to him. His past has been completely erased, and he's one of the few true amnesiacs some New York doctors have ever encountered. He can only remember two words, Coronet Blue. He needs to find out what they mean and who he is. The two shows ran at different times, so it was easy to watch both. Coronet Blue hadn't been running for that long, but I was 14, my two nephews were 15 and 13, and we didn't know from seasons. So when it was announced that Coronet Blue would be wrapping up right around the same time The Fugitive did, we were excited. Two of our shows giving the big reveal more or less in the same week. Double your pleasure, double your fun. Unfortunately for all of us, that week happened to fall right in the middle of our yearly trip to our cabin in the mountains of Idaho where there was no TV, barely any radio, and nobody to talk to about the shows. So yes, I missed the finale of one of the most iconic shows of all time. When I got home, my sister told me how The Fugitive ended. She told me wrong, but she told me. In 1993, ABC replayed the first and last episodes of the series to celebrate the release of the Harrison Ford movie. 26 years later, I finally saw what really happened. Not so with Coronet Blue. My sister didn't see that one, so none of us ever did find out who this guy was and what his deal was. I only mildly wondered why, and to be honest, I hadn't thought about the show much between then and now. What sparked my interest again? Believe it or not, The Flying Nun. I was reflecting on how they call their headgear a cornet. My ADD brain did a little free word association, and suddenly I came up with whatever became of that show. I tracked it down, watched it through again, and realized a lot of things that I didn't understand when I was 14. In particular, I realized why it only ran for 13 episodes. The series starred Frank Converse, a Shakespearean actor who was making the jump to movies and television. The show itself was a bomb, but it did get him noticed. He had a long, eventful career after this, and today it would seem he's retired and enjoying his family. The other man is the doctor who reassembled his various broken parts, but he doesn't have any idea how to reassemble our hero's mind. Our man says, I'm not going to get any answers sitting here. I have to get out there and find out who I am, if there's anybody who's worried about me, and what Coronet Blue means. Now, here's my first frustration with the show. I'm a musician, so when I hear the word coronet, my mind goes to this, a slightly different shaped sort of trumpet. This show never considers the possibility that that might be the kind of coronet in his phrase. Everybody thinks of this. One of the characters even says, yeah, it's a type of crown. But can you play jazz on it? And they never keep the words in the right order. He'll spend the next 13 weeks looking for blue coronets rather than trying to figure out what an obvious code phrase means. His search will take him all over the country, or at least to a few sets that are painted up to look like other parts of the country. As far as I know, they never did any actual location work. He'll go around chasing blue crowns, nightclubs named after blue crowns, you name it, always chasing the blue coronet rather than chasing coronet blue. 
That was something I did notice even when I was 14. I've been a wordsmith and lover of language literally all my life, and every time he or someone else said blue coronet, I wanted to scream at the TV, no, that's wrong! But you can't survive out there. You don't have a roof over your head, a dime in your pocket, not a single soul you can turn to. You don't even have a name. You put me together, right? Your name's Michael. Oh, come on. Alden General Hospital, Michael Alden. Okay, I got a name. Yep, you got a name. You don't got a driver's license or other ID to prove that's your name. You don't got no money. You don't got a clue where to go first. You're all set, dude. The doctor's biggest concern is that he'll get out there and the people who tried to kill him will finish the job. But he says, I was wrong when I said you have no one to turn to. You can come to me if you need something. As Michael Alden exits the hospital, we see the woman who ordered his death watching him. From there, we see him washing dishes at the Searching Eye, a local restaurant. Max Spire is the owner, operator, and Michael's new friend. Michael didn't try to flim-flam him. He told him the whole story and said, basically, I was born yesterday and I need a job. Max will become a semi-regular, and no matter where Michael goes in search of his identity, he always comes back to the searching eye to decompress. His first stop is looking for a guy named Warren Sapper who has a thing about blue crowns. Here we get our first real look at one of the biggest things wrong with the show. Where does he live, do you know? Here. Yeah. Honey, that's my whole row right there. Look it up. You know, this can't be the way Rita Hayworth met Ali Khan. Exciting stuff, huh? The entire series is loaded with drawn-out scenes like that where essentially nothing is happening. A good editor could have made this into a Honey West-type half-hour action show and the audience wouldn't have missed a thing. We have scenes of people looking at each other, not even moving, just looking. We get extended long shots of people walking. In fact, almost every episode ends like this. But it's not just at the end of an episode. We have them all over the place.
By the way, we just saw a very young Denholm Elliott and an equally young Juliet Mills, and that last one was Brenda Vaccaro. The show was a stepping stone for a lot of people who made it much bigger than this. So there was plenty of potential there, but poor choices like these wasted it. We have 10 second establishing shots, long panoramic shots that take who knows how long. There's far too much time where nothing happens. We have a word for that here, padding. It tells me somebody didn't have enough material to fill the runtime, so the director had to find ways to stretch things out the full 48 minutes. And that tells me the show was not ready for prime time. It had been filmed two years before its release, so there was plenty of time to ponder and maybe fix some things. Didn't happen, and the public could tell. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. You're shot, Alex. Oh, would you be a darling and play for me? <laughs> That's a baby. He looks so different. Spoiler. He'll fall for her hard, and the assassins who are trying to kill him hit her instead. With his heart so thoroughly broken, it's no wonder he finds himself with a different love interest every episode from here on out. Clearly, he's trying to run from the hurt. In episode four, we meet another recurring character who, had we used him more, might have rescued the series. Michael is there doing whatever it is he does all day when one of the guys who's after him shoots him in the shoulder. He falls over the railing and wakes up to this. He's in a monastery. There's a guy out by the front door scrubbing the floor. I wouldn't if I were you. Why not? Your friends are still there. What friends? What friends? Whoever was trying to kill you. Two men came to the gate asking for you. Meet Anthony. He's a novice in training and he's not supposed to be talking to Michael. Frater Anthony. Yes, Reverend. Report to my office. I'm sorry, Reverend. I'm trying Wordlessly, please. More important, he's not supposed to get caught. But he's scrubbing the floor because he's already in trouble. He's the one who brought Michael here in the first place. Against orders. Anthony. Mea culpa, Reverend. Excuse me. There's a stained glass window in the place that depicts the temptation of St. Anthony. St. Anthony looks exactly like Michael. Somewhat less saintly Anthony will help Michael find the name of the artist. Then the two of them slip out to go find him. But before they do that, let's watch Michael Alden in action. Why did you call me that? Mea culpa means my fault. Anthony, you called me Anthony, please. Why did you call me Anthony? You may go. Excuse me, I want to know. Why did you call me Anthony? He's that way with men, women. He'll manhandle anybody. You've seen me before, haven't you? Maybe. I'm not sure. I can tell from your eyes you have seen me. Perhaps on the street. Look at me. Tell me. What's coronet blue? Coronet blue? What are you... What do the words mean? Mike. No. No, no. Mike. I don't know what you were talking about. Mike, you're frightening her. She's frightening me because she knows something and she won't tell you. No, don't I you? I don't know anything. Mike. Why don't you tell me? He's pushy, grabby, aggressive, and threatening, and it's his first go-to approach to people. That's another problem with the series, because Michael is not a likable character. He uses his friends, roughs up undeserving people like this, gets in their faces demanding things. He's rude to the point of being boorish. More often than not, either Max or Anthony has to grab him and rope him in before he hurts someone, as we saw. Michael and Anthony make their way to the artist's studio where they meet his beautiful daughter. Of course. We're looking for Maurice Stray. He's not here. That's strange. The telephone book says he is. Maurice Stray is dead. He can't be. I should know I'm his daughter. Spoiler. 
Anthony falls for her and decides the life of a monk isn't for him. He'll become another new dishwasher at Max's restaurant. And you may have recognized the lady. Linda Day, she hadn't met Christopher George yet, was 22 and still doing bit parts. She's just one of an ongoing list of stars who had come into their own a while after this show. I'm helping Dr. Cortland with an experiment. Or a lab technician. Huh? Pete's not happy unless he can uh, stick you with a label. What am I again? A, a class AA grind? In translation, he's hooked on books and has a very heavy schedule. Yeah, they're much too heavy to waste time listening to the voice of rebellion. You are really pathetic. You know that everything I say is absolutely right. In this one room, we have Candace Bergen working only her third job on film. David Carradine, who had high hopes for his series Shane based on the movie. The series only lasted 17 episodes and had just ended, so he was back to doing bit parts. It would be another five years before the series Kung Fu made him famous. And John Voight, who at this point had done less than 10 film or TV jobs. He would keep doing things like this for two more years before burying his button Midnight Cowboy made him famous. We saw many, many more such up-and-coming stars, but one in particular stands out to me. In episode 10, these guys recruit Michael for a project to test man's endurance on long space flights. They want Michael because he has no deep emotional ties to anyone or anything on Earth thanks to his amnesia. He'll be paired with an Air Force officer who has a family, and the idea is to prove that the best spacemen are those with no ties to Earth. Let's meet well, Michael's no, co-pilot, Clay Bresnia. The two men with a Mars experiment will see the mist thing. They'll be connected by about eight times as much stuff as he's got, to sensory equipment, wires, medical instruments, to the control room, where all of their reactions will be recorded. Every hour or so, they'll get a shot. They'll be drugged intravenously. Somebody up there will press a button, and then the needles down here will jab them to sleep. That's 21-year-old Alan Alda still doing bit parts and trying to find his footing in the business. And you want to talk about a foretaste of things to come? The test gives them drugs to simulate the passage of time as well as drugs to make them sleep. Kind of like an Among Us game, they have tasks to do while the experiment is happening, simple things to test their reflexes and their cognitive ability. The simulation is supposed to feel like 180 days or six months. Around day 140-ish, Bresnia's mind snaps. Watch this. Clay Bresnia to control. Clay Bresnia to control. Preparing for re-entry. Clay Bresnia to control. Clay Bresnia to control. Preparing for re-entry. What re-entry? What's he talking about? Am I in voice contact? Repeat, am I in voice contact? Dr. Perkins. Uh, go ahead, we read you. Space vehicle performing normally. All systems go and ready for re-entry. I must report with sadness the death of my co-pilot, Michael Alden. He lives, however, to see the flag of the United States of America planted on the red earth of the planet Mars. He told Michael he was determined to be the first man on Mars, and he made it. I did it, didn't I, Dr. Ross? I did. You did fine. I, did. I wanted to more than anything in this world. I know. The president will call, only I'm counting on his call. Will he? Seriously, the whole process of watching him break down is worthy of an Emmy nomination at least. At this early age, you could see what a consummate actor he is. Part of the test is suddenly isolating the men from each other to see how they handle solitude after 130 days in space. Check out this performance. Where is he? What's happened to him? No, no, come on. Really, really, what happened? Where is he? What's happened to him? Simulator 2. Prepare for work period 130. I'm not fooled. You can't make me say this is real. I volunteered. Remember that. I'm no fool. The future's in the sky. Out here. Gotta beat those Ruskies. You count on that. I'll be part of it. Where is I can highly recommend that you watch the episode just for his performance. You didn't see me do that. The show tackled a lot of hot issues, including campus unrest and capital punishment. In the death penalty episode, a young man is killed even though Michael proves he was innocent. 
One of the characters actually says she doesn't approve of execution because it's too final. And she's right. Killing innocent people has happened way too often throughout human history, so suppose we just stop killing people. Someone will say, but it costs a lot to lock someone up and feed them for the rest of their lives. Oh, so you're saying money is more important than a human being's life. Might want to think about that. The episode about student protest pits the young generation against the old fuddy-duddies who are afraid of any kind of change. The head of the campus police seems to think his name is Buster Heads. He deals with everything using force and violence. It strikes me as a very subtle dig at what S.I. Hayakawa and his goons were doing to the campus of Berkeley at the time. The show tried to be irrelevant, and had it been more interesting, it might have succeeded. Possible. Probably not. The series ended without any conclusion, it just suddenly wasn't there. Hardly the big wrap-up we were expecting. It wasn't until 1997 that series creator Larry Cohen revealed the answer. Michael wasn't an American. He was a Russian agent trained to pass as an American. Coronet Blue was the code name of his spy ring. I told him it was a code.